Okay, I think we, we can start. Good morning. Uh, I have a friend in the in uh, who who is a professor in uh, at the Harvard University who starts his seminar looking at the audience, and then uh, he works in uh, cardiac regeneration as I do, and then he asks uh, uh, everybody to see who is sitting uh, on the, the the left side, who is sitting on the right side, and then uh, asking the, the three of them to decide who of the three will die because of cardiovascular disorders. And cardiovascular disorders means uh, in uh, more than 50% of the times uh, myocardial infarction and the incapacity of the heart to deal with the repair of myocardial infarction. And this is a reality because 30% of the people in the world die because of these diseases, much more than all cancers uh, uh, put together. And uh, if you think that this is a problem of uh, the industrialized world, you would be wrong because according to the uh, World Health Organization, 80% of deaths due to cardiovascular disorders are occurring in low and middle income countries. So the big cities in Africa and Asia, people die more because of these conditions than uh, because of HIV, malaria, dengue, and all the other infectious diseases. So if a person has a, a heart attack, so a sudden closure of a coronary artery. He suffers of a myocardial infarction, and uh, he has a chance to die immediately. He doesn't die, nobody dies, because the heart uh, doesn't function in terms of uh, contracting power. But uh, they die because uh, uh, after <clears throat> there is a sudden ischemia, so lack of oxygen of a portion of the heart, there is a high probability that uh, other portion of uh, the ventricle start uh, uh, behaving as pacemakers uh, and uh, and so basically there is a subversion of the normal electrical conduction of the electrical uh, uh, pulse which means that uh, there is a condition called uh, ventricular fibrillation so basically all the portion of the heart uh, starts contracting in a very asynchronous manner and basically there is no pump function if uh, these arrhythmias don't occur, or if the person uh, is uh, resuscitated immediately by heart massage uh, or by defibrillation, so the heart starts pumping again, the person is brought to the hospital. And uh, if it is uh, in, uh, uh, has a ch chance of uh, being close to uh, an interventional cardiologist unit, so a catheter laboratory in emergency within the two, three hours, most patients here are revascularized. So an interventional cardiologist inserts a catheter into the femoral artery, reaches the coronary artery, which is occluded by a thrombus, opens a balloon, and so the thrombus is dissolved, and the, the heart is revascularized. Obviously, uh, this determines how much of the heart has been lost during this process. Uh, and if the, the sooner the uh, uh, angioplasty, so the opening of the, of the uh, coronary artery occurs, uh, the better is uh, obviously the, uh, the, the outcome. Uh, the lower is the occlusion in the branches of the uh, coronary artery, the better is the outcome, the higher, the, 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 the bigger is the portion of the heart that uh, dies. When a portion of the heart dies, uh, it is never regenerated. The only way of repairing it is through formation of a scar. But a scar obviously makes uh, the heart uh, uh, pumping difficult. There is a, an event over the subsequent month that's called uh, ventricular remodeling. So there is a change in the geometry of the heart. And this is a very bad prognostic signal because it means that uh, most likely the patient over the next month will undergo a condition by which the heart will dilate the uh, ventricular walls will uh, become more thin and uh, uh, the capacity of contraction will be smaller. And so the capacity of uh, uh, pumping blood out of the heart will become smaller and uh, this can be measured very easily by a parameter which is called ejection fraction, so the percentage of blood which is pumped out of the heart every, every heartbeat. And when this is uh, starts lowering, then <clears throat> The patient undergoes a condition known as heart failure. This is a condition that I was referring to yesterday, saying that once there is a diagnosis of heart failure, 50% of patients are not alive anymore, only after four years. So there is a, a, a tremendous demand for heart regeneration, so to stimulate formation of new uh, uh, contractile mass. 
which is a, a problem that's not, uh, not trivial because usually when a, a coronary artery is blocked, the portion downstream of the uh, um, thrombus uh, is relatively big and it includes uh, from two to four billion cardiomyocytes. So basically, the therapeutic target is uh, to induce regeneration, so formation of, of, of a billion uh, cardiomyocytes. And people have tried uh, uh, over the last several years to, uh, starting from 2001, as we said yesterday, to try to uh, replace this lost portion by injection of stem cells of different derivation. First attempts with where we bone marrow cells, then these uh, stroma cells, uh, uh, again from the bone marrow, the adipose tissues, then uh, from a series of uh, putative stem cells that uh, would be, of course, uh, um, uh, residing in the adult heart. You see that uh, each of these uh, attempts have a question mark and uh, because they have failed, basically. There is no um, positive results with any of these attempts. More recently, and we also we said this yesterday, uh, the, there is a, uh, an attempt which has not reached the clinical experimentation yet, but is at the monkey level, by which uh, 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 cardiomyocytes are implanted, which are derived from ES cells, human embryonic stem cells, or from IPS cells, so the cells uh, which are equivalent to these obtained by the Yamanaka uh, factors. We don't know whether this uh, will be successful for, uh, by now, the problem with arrhythmia is, seems to be very, very difficult to uh, overcome. In any case, even if it will be successful, there will be certainly a problem of uh, extending this kind of treatment to the vast mass of people who have uh, this clinical problem. Another possibility is uh, uh, to try to convince the fibroblasts in the scar to become cardiomyocytes. And uh, this can be done, as uh, I also said yesterday, by transferring to fibroblasts uh, uh, transcription factors uh, that uh, change the identity of the cell. Uh, the idea would be to have a certain number of fibroblasts in the scar, which then uh, are convinced to become cardiomyocytes. Technically, uh, this is very challenging because you would need to transfer the transcription factor genes uh, that determine uh, the fate of a cell as a cardiomyocytes into fibroblasts in the heart but cardiac gene transfer into fibroblast is very, very difficult, very, very low efficiency. And then this would be a stoichiometric process. So you have a certain number of fibroblasts which can become the same number of cardiomyocytes as best. But obviously this would imply that you do gene transfer of these factors into billions of fibroblasts, which is really <coughs> beyond the technical possibilities at uh, this moment, uh, I thought there is intense research in this field. I showed you uh, this picture before, uh, and uh, to, to highlight what uh, around the early 2000s was a sort of dogma, that is that you can take this beautiful cardiomyocyte from, from the heart of an adult uh, um, um, animal or um, a man, put them in culture, and that they don't uh, replicate. And this is supported by the evidence I showed you yesterday. You remember the uh, atomic bomb explosions and the C-14 measurements uh, and so on. However, if you look at the same data with a, a more optimistic view, the, the half full um, uh, uh, glass uh, view, then you can say, okay, this is true that in a person uh, who is uh, 72 years old, uh, a, a more than 50% of the heart uh, is the same with which he was born, but it's also true that uh, a bit less than 50% has been renewed during the adult life. And there is evidence that uh, uh, this rate of renewal is uh, in the uh, uh, proximity of 1% per year. So 1% of cardiomyocytes is renewed uh, every year, which is uh, at the clinical level, which the, that doesn't make any sense. So the heart is post-mitotic, uh, heart, heart cells don't divide. But in principle, biologically, there is the possibility for replication and renewal. And also it is known that uh, if you look carefully in patients uh, in the border zone of an infarct, so in the surviving tissues around the infarct, there are some cardiomyocytes that can be seen to divide. So while this is again clinically ineffective, then uh, this biological possibility uh, exists. And so one of the exciting ideas that are emerging 
in the, in the last uh, two, three years, is uh, uh, to see if we can achieve regeneration of the heart from within. That is, uh, instead of implanting cells from the outside, uh, stimulating the endogenous reparative capacity that for some biological reasons is normally ineffective but still exists and so it can be boosted uh, somehow. The idea that the heart uh, is a post mitotic organ, that is cardio mass that don't replicate, uh, comes from, from uh, evidence that is very evident, very, very clear in the postnatal life. But obviously in the prenatal life, uh, the, the cardiomyocytes keep dividing because they have to reach a, a mass which is, a, which is a, a relevant. And so an obvious question in w is when does this replicative capacity stop? And I, I, this can be uh, addressed very easily also experimentally. Uh, you can take a mouse, for example, and uh, immediately at birth inject uh, a, a nucleotide analog, which is a bromodesoxyuridine. This is an analog of uh, 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 thymidine that gets incorporated into DNA when the cells replicate, so during the ES phases. And then there is an antibody that recognizes BRDU, and so basically the nuclei of cells that have replicated can be detected specifically with this uh, antibody. Uh, this is a, the, the kind of appearance that you see you, you have in the heart. And so this is a cardiomyocyte that have replicated in the last 48 hours uh, if you keep the BRDU infusion in the animal for 48 hours. And basically, if you do this experiment immediately at birth, you see that uh, almost uh, uh, um, uh, more than 35% of cardiomyocytes are <coughs> replicating in, in uh, uh, these conditions. So a, a vast proportion of uh, cardiomyocytes in the heart. If you repeat exactly the same experiment, uh, in an adult animals, for example, in a mouse at two months, then this uh, number drops uh, virtually to uh, zero. So there is no replication. So there is something that occurs immediately at birth. And at the same time, you can reproduce this also in culture. So you can take out a heart in adult uh, uh, animals, and you recover those beautiful cardiomyces that they will never divide. But if you recover the heart immediately in a uh, in a pup at birth, and you put in culture cardiomyocytes, you can see that also in culture, these cardiomyocytes retain a replicative capacity. For example, they express markers that distinguish S phase cells. So this is a staining of the nucleus of a cardiomyocyte with cyclin A, which is a, a, a cyclin, a protein that is the regulate the cell cycle is expressed in the late G1 and S phase of the cell cycle. These are other cardiomyocytes. These are uh, cardiomyocyte uh, stained with bromodesoxyuridine, so they have uh, just incorporated uh, BRDU and they have divided. And uh, uh, you see also mitotic figures. These are uh, chromosomes so that uh, divide uh, uh, before the two cardiomyocytes will divide. So there is this capacity of division immediately at birth. And you certainly have heard uh, uh, from Campos that uh, this division also leads to regeneration. So the, there are experiments uh, performed in the, the Hsam Sadek and Eric Olson laboratory a few years ago, 2011, by which uh, if you take the neonate heart uh, and you cut a portion of the heart, the easiest way of cutting is uh, the apex, then uh, this gets uh, completely uh, regenerated in uh, approximately two, three weeks. If you do this immediately at birth, uh, during the first week of life, if you do that after seven days, then you have repair through, through uh, a scar. <coughs> what happens at birth that blocks cardiomyocyte replication? This is a, a big question for which we don't have a clear answers, but uh, there are at least uh, four dramatic events that uh, occur in the heart uh, immediately at birth. The first one is that uh, before birth, the heart of the baby is uh, inside the womb of the mother. So it's very, very far from the oxygen uh, that is in the lung of the mother. So the heart is a venous organ. It receives uh, blood with the very low oxygen tension. Immediately after birth, the heart finds itself very close to the lungs. So it is uh, inundated by a uh, high concentration of oxygen in, in the blood. So there is a, an oxidative stress, an oxidative shock immediately uh, after birth. And this could be a signal that blocks uh, 
proliferation. This is uh, what uh, Esham Sadek believes. This is a paper to which we collaborated a couple of years ago, in which uh, basically it was shown that uh, if you culture cardiomyocytes in very low oxygen, then uh, these cardiomyocytes uh, can keep uh, replicating much longer than uh, if you expose them to atmospheric uh, oxygen. The idea would be that uh, High oxygen uh, provokes mitochondria to produce high levels of reactive oxygen species. This would damage DNA, trigger DNA damage response, and this would stop the cell cycle. However, this is probably part of the story. Certainly it is true, but uh, it is not the whole story. Another part of the story is that the heart uh, has much more uh, 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 load in terms of pressure immediately after birth. Again, before birth, the heart of the baby still keeps beating. It is the first organ that forms, so the heart keeps starts beating um, very early uh, um, after fertilization, after formation of the embryo. Uh, however, before birth, uh, it is uh, the heart of the mother that keeps most of the circulation running. It is only after birth that the heart has to keep against a strong gradient of pressure. And the, the heart cells could sense this strong gradient of pressure. Uh, there could be a signal that tells the cells, stop dividing, and now uh, hypertrophize your cytoplasm and build up contractile apparatus to cope with this increased afterload. What is the nature of this signal? It is, uh, it is not known at this moment, but this is another important component. Then there are two other things that occur. Immediately after birth, and this is known for, for, has been known for 40 years, there is a sudden switch from the use of glucose as a major source for formation of ATP to the use of fatty acid. And so basically 80% of metabolism before birth is based on glycolysis, 80% of metabolism after birth is, is uh, based on fatty acid oxidation. Whether this is a consequence of the stop of replication and uh, increase in hypertrophy, or it is the cause, it is completely un not known. There is nobody who has yet uh, studied the possible relationship between metabolism and uh, replication. And then there is something even more provocative, something that um, the, the, the newborn baby is missing uh, after birth is the mother. So it could be well be that the mother has some factors in the circulation that uh, are consent proliferation of the heart, which are completely withdrawn at the moment of birth. This has never been considered before. It's also another interesting new, new way of approaching, uh, of approaching the problem. In uh, <coughs> mechanistic terms, uh, 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 there is a, a change in the immediately after birth uh, in uh, the uh, gene expression program of these cells. So neonatal cardiomyocytes that still divide express a set of genes that are different from those that are expressed by the uh, um, cardiomyocytes in an adult uh, organism. And something that changes very drastically is also the set of non-coding RNA in, in the cells. Now, you know that uh, in our genome, uh, we, uh, we have the capacity to code for uh, approximately 20,000 proteins. Uh, these are what we normally call uh, protein coding genes, those that are we, we have been used to, to work with for uh, 50 years. But since uh, 10 years or so, 15 years, we know that in addition to these protein coding genes, there is a large number of uh, regions of our DNA that code for RNA which are never translated. And grossly speaking, these RNAs can be divided in small RNAs, which are called microRNAs, which are, will be the one we speak of in a moment, and long non-coding RNAs. These are long non-coding RNAs, uh, means uh, RNAs longer than 500 uh, nucleotides. Just to give you a numeric value, it is expected that the human genome, in addition to 20,000 protein coding genes, contain the information for approximately 2,000 microRNAs and something in the order of 80,000, 100,000, perhaps 120,000 long non coding RNAs, which is a word that is very, very rapidly expanding and also much more difficult to, to tackle in a, in a comprehensive manner. 
But microRNAs, I mean, are more limited in number. And in fact, if you look at microRNAs in uh, the neonate and you compare those uh, in the adult, you see that there are a number of microRNAs which are highly expressed in the neonate and then their expression drops down. And at the same time, uh, there are uh, uh, microRNAs whose expression is very low in the neonate and uh, then they become high in the adult. These microRNAs are uh, the product of uh, transcription of uh, genes uh, by uh, RNA polymerase 2, which is the same RNA polymerase that transcribes uh, protein coding genes. However, these transcripts are highly structures, uh, structured and are uh, uh, immediately recognized. They form these uh, hairpin uh, loop structures with uh, bulges coming out in this large loop. And they are immediately recognized in the nucleus by a complex of proteins, the most important of which are Drosia and uh, DGCR8 in humans. It is called the microprocessor. So this microprocessor recognizes these uh, uh, <coughs> primary transcripts, process them, and convert them in pre-microRNAs, which are uh, uh, stem and loop structures with imperfect pairing. They are approx approximately seven, uh, 75 base per long. And these are recognized in turn uh, uh, by a protein, which is called exporting 5, which takes them out of the nuclear pore. And once these, uh, these pre-microRNAs are in the cytoplasm, there is another complex uh, containing an endonuclease called DICER that recognizes them and processes them to form the final microRNAs, which are uh, 21, 22 uh, uh, nucleotides long, double-stranded uh, 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 RNA with the imperfect pairing of the two strands, which basically come from these stem and loop structures uh, here. And these microRNAs eventually get assembled to another uh, um, complex of proteins that's called uh, uh, RISC. Here the main dominant protein is Argonaut. And uh, at this point, one of the two strands is displaced from the duplex. Only the other uh, strand remains. The dis displaced strand is called passenger RNA. The uh, strand that remains is called guide RNA. And then this becomes the template for pairing to messenger RNA of the cells. So basically, this is a template for base pairing. So um, messenger RNA are recognized, and their uh, uh, function is blocked at the le level of uh, translation, so they cannot be translated, or at the level of destruction, so they, they are depolyadenylated and disrupted. The ultimate, uh, 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 the ultimate uh, result is that the protein for which this mRNA were coding is uh, down-regulated. Uh, so basically, each microRNA can down-regulate the expression of the protein, but since pairing, pairing, best pair here, pairing here is not perfect, each microRNA can recognize tens of hundreds of different messenger RNAs, and so they down-regulate basically expression of tens or hundreds of different proteins. So these are uh, sort of rheostats that uh, block simultaneous expression of a variety of proteins. Obviously, in evolutionary terms, they have been selected to block expression of a lot of proteins and change uh, the fate or the function or the destiny of the cells. In, in biology now, there is virtually no process that uh, in which uh, uh, microRNAs are are not involved, ranging from every step of development and differentiation to cancerogenesis, uh, cell proliferation, and, and uh, so on and so forth. If you knock out uh, the, the component of these processor pro uh, complexes, this is incompatible with life. Uh, so the idea that uh, there are microRNAs that somehow are uh, uh, involved in all processes uh, suggested that there might be perhaps some microRNAs also involved in regulating proliferation of, uh, of cardiomyocytes. And uh, uh, we have available a, a facility that uh, for high throughput screening, so these are robotic stations uh, for uh, automated screenings of uh, chemical compounds or small nucleic acids, and we have libraries corresponding to uh, microRNAs of uh, human, mouse, rat origin, or uh, uh, um, even uh, um, 
um, uh, libraries of nucleic acids that block uh, microRNAs by base pairing with them. So a few years ago, we uh, asked ourselves whether we can uh, find uh, among uh, the human microRNAs some microRNA that could uh, stimulate cardiomyocyte proliferation. So basically, the screening was a high throughput screening, 96 well plates. We had at that time available uh, about 1,000 uh, microRNAs, uh, synthetic microRNAs. So in each of these uh, uh, wells, uh, we plated uh, uh, cardiomyocytes from neonatal mice. And then to each of the wells, in a robotic manner, we added one specific microRNAs. And the screening was performed by high content microscopy. It means that uh, uh, this is an image of a cardiomyocyte that you see at microscopy. In, uh, in red, in, in green, you see cardiomyocytes. In, in blue, all nuclear are stained with a, a chemical compound called HEXT. And then uh, uh, we added BRDU for 48 hours and, and then stained with an antibody. So where you see red, violet, which means red plus blue, these are nuclei of replicating cells. Some of the nuclei are inside cardiomyocytes, some are outside, and these are fibroblasts that contaminate always this kind of preparation. About 5% of preparation from the heart are fibroblasts, which is good, a good internal control. Then this image is taken up by uh, a microscope uh, the, that converts this to a computer-generated image in which the contours or cardiomyocytes are uh, evident, and then in which each uh, um, uh, red nucleus inside the cardiomyocyte here is uh, uh, um, shown in uh, yellow. So basically, the machine tells you what is the percentage of yellow nuclei inside cardiomyocytes, and the percentage in a normal condition is around 12%. These are uh, the cells treated with two microRNA that increase proliferation, and uh, basically the percentage is uh, almost uh, 50 uh, 50%. Percent. So basically at the end of the story we identified uh, we identified uh, almost 40 microRNAs human microRNAs that very significantly stimulate cardiomyocyte proliferation. So this was the first demonstration that you can really play with the proliferative potential of these cells by playing with the microRNA network. When I see proliferation I don't I'm not saying only cardiomyocyte uh, uh, incorporation of BRDU, so passage through the S phase, but I see, I say, real proliferation. So this can be seen, for example, by checking other markers in different phases of the cell cycle. For example, there is an antibody against a phosphorylated form of histone H3, which accumulates only in G2M. You see that uh, if you take the top microRNAs, all of these increase uh, the percentage of cardiomyocytes that go through G2M. And this is uh, instead a protein, Aurora B, which localizes in these uh, elongated structures. I hope you can see them here. These are called mid-bodies. And this is the final step of karyokinase. When those two cells, when a cell divides, the two daughter cells divide, and they are connected for a limited amount of time by a sort of tubule where this protein accumulates. These are called mid-bodies. So seeing an uh, um, uh, increase in mid-bodies means that there is really division of cells. And what's most important is you see that, for example, this is one of the most properly for the microRNA. The, the plate is filled by cardiomyocytes after six days while the controls cardiomyocytes stop dividing. So that was uh, uh, very, very exciting. It was even more exciting that this worked in vivo also in uh, neonatal cardiomyocytes. And uh, uh, these are neonatal hearts. This is the control. This is treated with uh, a, a, a microRNA from C. elegans, so which should not have, find no targets in mammals. And you see that this is a left ventricle. This is a longitudinal section of the heart. Left ventricle, right ventricle. And here, cardiomyocytes are in green. And, uh, and uh, uh, replicating cells are in red. You see that these are this is the aorta, the pulmonary uh, vein, so the big vessels that have a lot of replicating cells. Uh, these are two hearts injected with uh, two of the most effective microRNAs, 590-199A. And you see immediately that the hearts are bigger and that the ventricles here, so the size of these ventricles is bigger than here. And, and these are bigger because simply they have many more cells. So you see here that uh, at birth, uh, replication is very limited in the ventricles, so the, the mass, the contractile mass is limited, uh, uh, is, is a bit more evident to the endocardiums, which, which is the endothelial cells lining uh, the, 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 um, 
center of the ventricle or the epicardium. How, uh, however, if you inject the microRNA, you see many replicating cells inside the ventricles themselves. So this is what is called in pathology hyperplasty. So you in increase the number of cells in an organ. If you look at the um, um, higher resolution, you see that there are a lot of cardiomyces with a, a nucleus that has incorporated BRDU, uh, and uh, they are happily integrated with the muscle fibers. Uh, 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 of these two, uh, this is uh, uh, upregulated uh, in uh, um, the neonates and the embryo and downregulated in the adults. So basically we are restoring uh, the, the level that were before. This is never expressed in the heart. So this is a microRNA that uh, does not belong to the heart. Because the screening obviously didn't take into account what is uh, expressed, what is not expressed. We wanted uh, a, a therapeutic agent uh, for proliferation, and, uh, and this is not expressed in the heart. And so b b probably what it does is to impart a program that is not the same as uh, the one in embryogenesis. And so some of these in general are physiological, uh, and some of these are therapeutic. This is, these are neonates, uh, and you simply open up the chest and inject in the heart. Close the chest, uh, wait a few days, uh, sacrifice the animals, and do the sections. Oh, this at that time, this was um, an experiment that started in 2011, so five years ago, and this was the only library that was available. So this is a library from Dar Macon. It's a commercial library of synthetic microRNAs. It was the, the compilation of microRNAs according to the knowledge five years ago. Now we know that uh, we have almost doubled these. And, uh, and uh, we, are, we have also screens uh, for uh, all the 2,000 microRNAs of, uh, of human origin. And uh, there are additional microRNAs that do the job. Oh, uh, simply because we put thresholds uh, to decide that uh, that uh, we wanted to uh, to work on this. So the threshold was very simple. So we wanted those that increase at least twofold proliferation in both uh, human, mouse, and rat. This was a screening of human sequences in the rat, but we wanted universal reagent that worked also in uh, in uh, mice and also in human cells. And so this is why we shortlisted them to forty. Yeah, yeah, you, you, you will see a, a lot of functional data now. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, obviously, if you want to have a, a, a perspective, a, a translational perspective, you want these microRNAs to be expressed for a long period of time. And uh, uh, so a single shot injection in the neonate, uh, it, I mean, it goes to our favor because uh, this is a condition when uh, still cardiomyces have a capacity to proliferate. And uh, the assumption uh, at that moment was that uh, if you inject a double-stranded RNA, this would last uh, very little. So even ourselves were surprised to see such a big effect. But, but, but obviously, if you want to have a prolonged expression, you have to, uh, I mean, um, you, uh, you have to use uh, a, a system that uh, permits uh, endogenous expression of these microRNAs. And uh, uh, the, the way that you can express genes uh, in the cardiovascular system is uh, uh, by using a vector, uh, a viral vector system based on a virus that is called adeno-associated virus. So this is uh, the best and, pro to my opinion, even the only way of expressing genes for a prolonged period of time and very high efficiency in the heart. So this AAV is a, a, a small virus that uh, is broadly diffused in the population. So um, almost 90% of us have uh, antibodies against uh, uh, this virus. And uh, uh, nevertheless, uh, we don't have any disease uh, uh, associated with this, uh, with this infection. So probably this is a virus that circulates in the population during our infancy, we all get infected, and then it remains uh, as, uh, as uh, a commensal in the, human, in the human population. 
It is a very small virus. Uh, when I say small, it means that uh, it has a diameter of approximately 20 nanometers. Uh, and uh, uh, it consists of uh, a small genome, which is single-stranded, with the exception of these two herpins, surrounded by 60 proteins that come from the same gene. So basically, when I describe this uh, in, uh, in uh, 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 nanotechnology uh, meetings, I describe this as, as a perfect uh, nanobiotechnology particle. So 20 nanometers, uh, 60 proteins, uh, and uh, one nucleic acid surrounding it. And genetically, this is very simple. So it has only two genes, so which are called repec You can comp completely remove these genes and substitute them with any genes you are interested in, uh, provided it is expressed from a promoter and it has a polydenylation site. What remains of the virus is uh, uh, only these uh, uh, two herpins, which are 146 nucleotide long, uh, the two extremities. They don't code for any protein, so the, the virus, once the virus is inside the cell, it is completely unseen and transparent to the immune system. It doesn't cause inflammation. And uh, for some very interesting reasons that are um, pertinent to the biology of this virus, uh, if you use this uh, virus uh, to transfer genes inside cells in the laboratory, it doesn't work. It's the worst system you can use. However, if you inject it uh, directly in vivo, you will find that uh, the virus goes to uh, specific cell types. Uh, for example, if you inject in the muscle, it goes uh, to the uh, skeletal muscle fibers. If you inject it in the heart, it goes to the heart. But uh, in the heart or in the skeletal muscle, it goes to uh, muscle fibers or cardiomyocytes, but not, for example, to endothelial cell, not into fibroblasts in these organs. If you inject in the brain, it goes to neurons, but not to the glial cells. If you inject in the retina, it goes basically to all cells in the retina. So basically, it has a, a specific tropism for post-mitotic cells, so cells that have exited the cell cycle and uh, never replicate, which is fantastic because yesterday I told you that the problem of regenerative medicine and the, the big problem of medicine in general is that we have uh, uh, cells in our body that don't replicate, so they don't regenerate. And these are uh, the cells in uh, cardiomyocytes in the heart, our neurons in the brain, our beta cells in the pancreas, our retinal cells. And this vector is perfect exactly to transfer genes into these cells, so a perfect vehicle. If we want, we can discuss. Um, I think we, we think we believe now that we understand why there is this specific tropism. And there are some variations of uh, these uh, surface proteins, of these 60 proteins that are on the coat of the virus, that uh, amino acid variations that also permit the virus to circulate and go to these organs. For example, uh, this defines a serotype that's called number 9. Uh, this AV9 can be injected intraperitoneously, intravenously, goes uh, in the circulation and ends up in the heart and in the muscle. And it stays there forever because these cells don't divide. And so they survive as the animal survives. So the virus is there. We have uh, some experiment performed in dogs uh, five, six years ago in which the virus has survived all throughout these years without causing any kind of, of disease. And the system is very efficient. This is a virus expressing a fluorescent protein injecting injected IP, and you see the extent of uh, uh, gene transfer into the heart and specifically into, into uh, cardiomyocytes. And obviously, we, the first thing that we did was to adapt this virus to have as a gene the gene coding for the microRNA. So basically, uh, this is I mean, the same, it's very uh, simple. So uh, you put the microRNA gene uh, with a, a promoter, which in our case was constituted a promoter, a polydenylation site, and then these transcripts produced are then processed through, through the uh, RNA processing machinery for microRNAs. And uh, in this case, the heart were much bigger even microscopically. So we could wait, for example, 12 days from injection. This is, again, neonates. And you see that immediately you see these huge hearts in the, the animals. If you measure function of these hearts by standard functional measurements, which is the echocardiography, then you see no difference from normal hearts. I still remember the, the, the moment when the postdoc of this experiment came to my office with two tubes. In one, there was a normal heart, in another, a big heart. Uh, and she said, guess which one has microRNA, which one is the, is the uh, uh, control. 
Uh, but this heart is perfectly normal. It's not taking the heart uh, from the chest of a bigger animal and putting this uh, into a smaller animal. And what was more interesting is that, uh, was that uh, when we injected these uh, AV vectors uh, immediately after myocardial infarction, basically they uh, completely uh, helped the cardiac function. Uh, this is a measurement of this parameter I mentioned before, ejection fraction. So this is a percentage of blood pumped out every heartbeat. Normal conditions uh, in mice, it is this dotted line, so almost 60% of the heart is pumped out. If you do myocardial infarction after 12 days, uh, this is uh, significantly reducing white, and then it goes progressively down in two months. This is heart failure in mice, basically. If you give a navy vector expressing uh, the microRNAs, the parameters remain at the basal level. This is another parameter called fractional shortening. So how much the heart wall can contract. You see almost preservation to normal levels. This is a left ventricular anterior wall thickness in systole. So how big is the ventricular wall when the heart contracts? You see, again, complete preservation. What's well, even more interesting is that after two months, when we sacrificed these animals, uh, the, in control animals, there were huge scars here. This is a transversal section of the heart, so this is the left ventricle, the right ventricle, and, uh, and uh, the scar here is in blue, the, the muscle is in red. You see that uh, this part of the ventricle has been completely substituted by a huge scar. A human would, would never be able to live with such a big scar, or rodents do, but uh, the, the animal that received this microRNA 590 or 199A and the scar is much smaller, and uh, you can measure this also. There is a very significant uh, different difference. So one question that we posed ourselves after these, uh, these results was, uh, uh, which are the cells on which this cardiomyocyte work? Because, you know, these experiments were, were, were published in 2012, and this was the time when a lot of people in, in the world still, it's not a long time ago, but the, the, the paradigm has really shifted over the last two, three years. A lot of people believe that there are stem cells in the heart that regenerate the heart. So we did uh, an experiment uh, that uh, in genetics is called the fate mapping experiment. So basically, uh, um, uh, we wanted to see which is the cell type that replicates uh, after we give the uh, microRNA. Is it uh, cardiomyces that already exist, that are pushed to proliferate, or is it another cell type that comes there and then proliferates because of the microRNA? And, and this experiment was performed in, in this manner. We, we had a mouse that uh, contains uh, the CRE recombinase, in, uh, at, uh, which is sensitive to uh, tamoxifen, is activated by tamoxifen, under the control of a promoter which is expressed only in adult uh, cardiomyocytes, in differentiated cardiomyocytes, the alpha myosin heavy chain promoter. And we crossed these with mice which contain uh, the target sequences of this recombinase, so the LOXP site, to flank the GFP protein. So basically, these mice uh, are all dark, but if CRE is activated in some organ, then uh, the cells of that organ become green. And uh, the organ in which is activated CRE is an organ that expresses the alpha myosin heavy chain promoter. So basically, this is a way to have uh, the cells uh, in the heart, the cardiomass in the heart of these animals becoming green and only those cells. And in fact, after seven days, we give tamoxifen to activate the recombinase, 85% of the cardiomass in the heart becomes green. So these are normal animals with green cardiomyocytes in the heart. Then at that point, these animals will ligate the coronary artery, so we induce an infarction, injecting the AV vector expressing the microRNA in the presence uh, of uh, bromozos uridine or EDU. This is another analog that we use sometimes. And, uh, and then uh, the question is, are the cells that uh, start incorporating this so that they replicate, are they green or are they black? If they are green, it means that uh, the pre-existing cardiomyocytes were pushed to proliferate. If they are black, it means that uh, the cardiomyocytes, uh, the, the, the cells that proliferate come from another source, so the blood, the circulation, other cells in the heart, fibroblasts, whoever knows. Well, the, the answer was that all the cells that become green were, well, become, uh, had a red nucleus were also green before. You see these are cardiomyocytes with the red nucleus, and it's clearly these nuclei belong to pre-existing cardiomyocytes. Here there are some pictures, you see these big cardiomyocytes that have been pushed by this microRNA or this microRNA 
to uh, proliferate. So clearly, it seems that this microRNA stimulates pre-existing cardiomyocytes to, to proliferate. And so we, we became more, uh, say, brave and uh, uh, started to ask the question, well, let's see if they can push proliferation also adult cardiomyocytes. So those cells that nobody has seen to proliferate. And so basically, we took this big cardiomyocyte that you have seen before. We added some serum to have some source of growth factors. Nothing happens. And then at that time, we transfected the microRNAs. And this you see that uh, all these microRNAs, uh, with one exception, all these microRNAs push proliferation of uh, these uh, big cardiomyocytes. You see that the nuclei starts incorporating uh, BRDU. And uh, uh, they express marker of S phase. This is a control. And these are uh, big cardiomyocytes, these monstrous cells that start entering the uh, S phase. They also go through P G2 mitosis. This is staining for this phosphorylated histone A3. You see these uh, big cardiomyocytes in G2M. Some of these, you also see this mitotic uh, uh, condensation of chromosomes that start dividing. So you have these big cells starting to divide, which is very, very remarkable because this is the first time that uh, we can really see adult uh, cardiomyocytes that divide in response to these, uh, to these cells. And, and so basically, uh, uh, this is uh, surprising for mammals and uh, has never been seen before. Let me skip this. Uh, it's not relevant. But uh, it is not surprising uh, for um, biology in general because this is exactly what happens uh, and, and you've seen that uh, uh, with, with Kempos in, uh, in zebrafish or in, uh, in salamander. When you have a, 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 a regeneration of the heart in these animals, what you have is that uh, existing cardiomyocytes go a little back in their differentiation process. So they start disassembling the contratile apparatus, the sarcomere, and they keep dividing until regeneration occurs. So what we believe that we are doing here with these microRNAs is simply to go back to a, a, a program in which there is uh, uh, the same program as uh, physiologically zebrafish and the salamander keep for the rest of their life, and that for some reasons uh, we have lost as mammals uh, immediately, immediately uh, after, after birth. Then one can ask, but is it a specific effect of these microRNAs for cardiomyocytes, or it is a pro-proliferative effect that is exerted in all cell types? And here I'm, I'm going to, to answer indirectly this, uh, this question, showing you another of the screen that, that we do. We love biology made of screenings. So we, we think we are in an era in which we can do screens instead of doing candidate gene studies. You know, molecular biology and genetics and, and started 40 years ago studying candidate genes. So the first genes that were studied in detail were, were the genes coding for globins, so hemoglobin and its, its component. This is a targeted gene approach. And that has been the basis of all studies for 30 years. And the people had their own candidate gene. They studied all the gene, how it functions, how it interacts with other proteins, how individual mutation of amino acids can lead to change in this uh, function. And then, in most cases, uh, you study your favorite genes, and uh, at the end of your paper, you ask, well, perhaps it has a function in vivo. So you do a few mouse experiments, and, and then, at the end of the story, you publish a paper in which uh, figure five and figure six has the results, and say, now I've studied these genes, very interesting, these are the mutation thing, and it works in also. I confirm this in vivo. Now, if you ask yourself, and this has generated a tremendous amount of biochemical and biological information, but if you ask yourself how many of these proteins are relevant for function, then very few. And how many of these proteins uh, that have been studied in this way, for example, are therapeutic proteins, even less. So, for example, genes that are involved uh, in proteins that are involved in repairing the myocardium, you can have a list of uh, 50 different proteins in the literature of the last 30 years. Uh, if you ask how many of these have become therapeutic, so the answer is zero, none. Because obviously, uh, by studying one candidate gene, you cannot judge the relevance of these genes in the more 
broad context. Is this the best gene you have to study? Nobody knows. You, you try to, to, to prove this in figure five or see figure six of this experiment. And this was the first wave of studies, biochemical study, which was followed by the second wave of studies in which people started doing omics approaches. Omics approaches means that you take a, a picture. You take a picture of what is changing from normal and pathology or normal conditions and treatment. You can take a picture of the metabolome, a picture of uh, the transcriptome, a picture of the mirnaome, a picture of the interactome, a picture of the lipidome, whatever. These are just pictures. At the end of the pictures, you end up with big Excel files that uh, are very difficult to, to study. We know this, <laughs> this is very, uh, very well. So it's very difficult to understand inside these changes what is uh, the real uh, uh, set of genes or individual genes that could be a trigger. Uh, how many drugs or how many treatments are you aware of that came from omics studies? I don't know anyone. I know several studies that gives you a broad picture of what's going on, but if you want to find a trigger that can be used therapeutically, this is probably not the way to go. Now, however, we have a complete information on the genome, complete information on the transcript, on, on the mirnome, and we have robotic stations to study directly function. So why don't doing, as we like to do, a, a biology a discovery path, which is based on screening for function first? So for example, we are interested in cardiomyocyte proliferation. We screen for function on microRNAs, and then uh, and only for those who have a function, for example, the stimulate proliferation, we study how they work. So we go, we are sure first that these are the best ones and they are effective. And then we try to understand how this, they work. I think that this is a, a, a much more straightforward pathway for uh, biological discovery now. So this is just to say that uh, we do a lot of screenings uh, in the laboratory. One of the screenings that we did was again for, for proliferation, well, but was for proliferation uh, in another completely different setting, was proliferation of senescent fibroblasts. So yesterday we spoke a bit about senescence, and uh, one, a part of senescence, which is still not clear how this does it refer to, to real aging in vivo, but is cellular senescence. So if you take fibroblasts from an individual, you can culture them, and then at a certain point, they stop dividing. And they stop dividing uh, uh, depending on the age of the individual from which you have taken them. If you take fibroblasts from a neonate, they stop dividing after 50 passages, 50, 60 passages. If you take a fibroblast from an aging person, for a person of 70 years old, they stop dividing after two, three passages. This, is, uh, this number of passages is called the Hayflick number to the, to the, um, uh, under the name of the person who discovered this, uh, this event. And so the idea here was uh, to see if we can screen the same library for microRNA that uh, permit uh, proliferation of senescent uh, human fibroblasts. So basically, we push cells to senescence. Senescent cells express a lot of marker of senescence, like being enlarged and expressing um, an enzyme which is uh, called senescent associated beta galactosidase. And then uh, we search whether there are some microRNAs that push these cells to proliferate. I don't enter into the detail of the screening. These are the results. So basically, we uh, found that if you see one, it means that the microRNA has no effect. We saw a lot of microRNA that push cells to senescence, although they are below one. But also we found uh, a certain number of microRNA, 39 microRNAs, that push the cells to proliferate. Some of these are very, very interesting because uh, some of these, uh, they, they, they don't even... Uh, uh, they don't even require serum. This is m the most remarkable experiment I've seen in the last year. That is, uh, this is a correlation of the effect of some selected microRNAs in uh, uh, the presence of 10% serum, as there are normal culture conditions, and the complete absence of serum. So, for example, you see that this microRNA pushes... Uh, proliferation of cells that are senescent, either, either with serum or without serum. So think of a senescent cell put without serum. You put a microRNA, and this, boom, starts proliferating. So it means that uh, we have probably bypassed all the requirements for stimulation of growth factors with receptors on the surface. We don't have an idea on how this microRNA this works, and this is something that, that we are studying. Yes. Uh, 
No, we can, we can push them to proliferate for a few rounds, but if we keep expressing this microRNA, for example, with the lentiviral vectors, then uh, they die by apoptosis. So we push them dividing for a few cycles, but we, we don't immortalize them. Which, by the way, for therapeutic purposes is, is, is even better. No? The, this, this experiment were, were, were uh, inspired by uh, my personal desire of finding something that could push rejuvenation. So this is a sign that I'm getting old, and so this becomes uh, one, one, uh, one of the, 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 big, the big goals of research. Well, I'm showing this be because uh, there are some microRNAs that we selected for in this screen that are exactly identical to the microRNA that we selected for uh, in the cardiomyocyte screen. For example, there is one family that uh, turned out uh, all these family members. Uh, they have the same seed sequence, uh, so the sequence that is ma makes a pairing with the target mRNAs, and they all show up to increase proliferation of both cardiomyocytes and senescent cells. It's called the 302. 367 cluster. Uh, you see these are the results for the cardiomyocytes. You see that this cluster, basically all the members uh, turned out uh, to, be, uh, to be positive. And uh, this is a very famous family of microRNAs because it is absolutely required for uh, um, keeping stem cell identity. So basically a, an embryonic stem cell remains an embryonic stem cell until this family of microRNAs is expressed. If you block their expression, they start differentiating. Not only, but uh, if you force the expression of these microRNAs in other cell types, you make this cell type becoming an embryonic stem cells. In fact, this is a paper published by the Morrissey Laboratory la uh, two years, last year, March last year, in which he showed that uh, this microRNA uh, family, if you make a transgenic mouse expressing this in the heart, you have the cardiomyocyte keeping proliferating, but they also are not more cardiomyocytes. They become embryonic stem-like cells, and eventually the animal die. So basically, proliferation is not only a goal, but uh, the only goal, but it should be proliferation coupled with the permanence of the cell in an embryonic stem, uh, in, in, uh, in a cardiomyocyte state. Uh, another family that, that turned out is this uh, 1792 family. This is also a family which is known in, in the literature, in uh, the, the tumor literature, because it's called the Oncomir-1. It was discovered as a, a series of uh, microRNA that push cells to, uh, cancer cells to uh, proliferate. Uh, again, this is another problem, because uh, if, you, if you want proliferation in the heart, the least thing that you would want is that the same microRNA also push proliferation of tumor cells in the patients. Please. Oh, in, uh, well, in, in our case, we, we, we work it one, with one microRNA at a time, so our goal is to find a biotherapeutic, so something that we can inject in a patient with myocardial infarction. In physiological conditions, uh, there are experiments in which uh, um, it seems that, um, for example, for the 302 family, there is no redundancy. So if you block one member, the other members don't compensate because they have slightly different targets despite sharing the same seed sequence. Uh, in general terms, however, if you may plot a correlation between proliferation of cardiomyocytes and proliferation of uh, fibrous, senescent fibroblasts, there is a very little proliferation. And so we are very confident. For example, those we concentrate on, like uh, 590, 1822, uh, and 199, uh, they, they work only in cardiomyocytes, which is exactly what we want, so something that is more specific for, for cardiomyocytes. And all those that we selected don't push experimentally proliferation of fibroblasts. So this is a proliferation of cardiomyocytes. This is proliferation of fibroblasts. These are the top ones, uh, and you see that uh, they, they don't work in fibroblast, basically. We know something more uh, now on how they work, and uh, most of them work through the activation of a pathway, which again I think you are familiar with, which is the HIPPO pathway. So basically, uh, this is a, a, a main uh, pathway which is involved in uh, transduction of signals, or mechanical signals of the cells. And the pathway is in, in, in a pathway has an activator, which is called YAP1, which is a transcriptional coactivator 
that when it is in the nucleus, it drives expression of a pro-proliferative genes. But, uh, uh, but this activator can be deactivated by phosphorylation. And there is a cascade of kinases in the cytoplasm that keeps this uh, activator phosphorylated and uh, inactivated in the cytoplasm. Uh, we made an experiment by which uh, we had a, a reporter promoter sensitive to the presence of YAP and uh, uh, transfected this uh, reporter into cardiomyocytes and then treated these cardiomyocytes uh, with the pro-proliferative mirnas. So this is the effect of proliferation of a series of mirnas in this experiment. And these are the levels of activation of this promoter. You see that uh, with a lot of differences from uh, from um, a microRNA to microRNA, but basically most of them activate uh, this, uh, this uh, um, uh, YAP-mediated coactivation. Not only, but if simultaneously we give the microRNA, we have proliferation, but simultaneously we give an siRNA, so we block YAP, then we block this proliferation. So it means that uh, this is the pathway that is common to most of these uh, microRNAs. We now also know which uh, are the targets, at least for one of these. This uh, is called uh, 199A3P, which is uh, the one we concentrate our attention on. And one of the direct targets uh, of this microRNA is the kinase called tauk one which is upstream of the uh, kinase uh, uh, cascade. Another target is uh, beta-TRCP, and beta-TRCP is uh, uh, um, ubiquitin ligase that drives uh, phosphorylated YAP for deactivation. So if you block this, you have more YAP. And a uh, third target uh, <coughs> is uh, uh, cofilin 2, which is a protein which is involved in actin polymerization. Every time you have cell proliferation, you must have actin, polymer actin uh, polymerization. This is work that uh, we are carrying out in collaboration with uh, Matteo and Ryan, who, who uh, um, uh, are here. Uh, I don't want to go into my much detail on that uh, at, this, uh, at this moment, but we think that this is effect. So basically what we are doing is it impacting on a physiological pathway for cardiomyocyte proliferation. I want instead to end up with uh, just two small stories that uh, are uh, uh, very important in my view in terms of uh, translation one is related to the possibility of having this working at the clinical level. Now, you know, the a mouse heart is this big, and so uh, uh, regenerating a few millions of cardiomyocytes uh, in the mouse heart uh, can be easy, but regenerating billions of cardiomyocytes in a human heart can be much more, more, much more difficult. Now, the pig heart uh, has more or less the size of humans, and uh, it has the same anatomy and physiology. So this is usually in the cardiovascular field considered a very good model to test a preclinical application before going to clinical trials. And so we set up a system in which we have, a, and this is a collaboration with a group in, uh, in, in Pisa, in which uh, we have uh, farm pigs, in which uh, we ligate the coronary artery, so induce an infarction. And then in the infarct border zone, we have uh, 10 injections of an AV vector expressing 199A, so the, this one on which we, con we concentrated our attention on this because it is, the sequence is exactly conserved in all the species that are known in the microRNA databases. And the results are, are really stunning. In terms of uh, uh, f uh, infarct size, this is how infarct size goes in the first two months after infarction. So at day two, the infarct is more or less the same. But if you look at uh, after one week or after four weeks, uh, you see that uh, the animals treated with the microRNA have a much bigger, a smaller infarct size. If you look at ejection fraction, again, it's more or less the same at day two. But at week one, those treated with the microRNA have a very significant uh, increase in ejection fraction. And what was more, more remarkable is that we follow these animals by uh, magnetic resonance imaging. Magnetic resonance imaging is uh, the best way to follow the uh, uh, function uh, and anatomy uh, of the heart in a very objective, objective manner. So these are uh, two animals, one treated with a control and one treated with this microRNA. And uh, each animal is uh, uh, seen at uh, week one, week four, and week eight. And these are serious sections from the, the apex of the heart up progressively to the uh, base of the heart. Uh, this is the left ventricle, and this is the right uh, ventricle. 
So if you see a week one in the control, for example, take this middle session or this middle session here, you see that uh, 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 there is a big infarct here. The infarct is contrasted in red for better visualization. You have a big infarct, which is in the septum and the free wall of the left uh, ventricle. And basically, this is an infarct that progressively over two weeks becomes a scar. And you see the scar is very big, the, 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 the ventricle has dilated, the walls are much more thin. Uh, however, if you look at the animal treated with 199A, at uh, week one, uh, there is no big difference. However, at week four, you see that the scar has reduced a lot. And uh, week eight, uh, there is a very, really very, very little remaining. This is a close-up, you see that there is... A, very little sky, you see the difference from here to here. This is a, here it has almost disappeared. This is a very, very, very reminiscent of, of regeneration. I have also a, a movie which is very telling. So this is a, a, no, a heart uh, in, uh, infarcted and treated with a control. You see enormous dilatation of the ventricle, thinning of the septum and the free wall of the, of the, the ventricle. This heart is uh, severely dyskinetic, dysfunctional. And uh, if you look at, uh, instead, this is a heart that was injected with the navy vector expressing the microRNA, and you see that it pumps uh, uh, much, much better. It has not dilated. There is a much more contractile tissue there. So this is a really very, very exciting view of, of translation. Uh, I show you the results with 199A and now in, in, in the mouse. Here we don't know. Uh, the problem with AV vectors that I have is that uh, this is very fantastic, and uh, uh, I would uh, I keep receiving uh, I keep receiving emails uh, after we publish this data of, of people saying, well. Uh, I, the typical email I receive is that uh, I'm, uh, I'm a 42-year-old person. I've been uh, an athletic person all throughout my life. I used to practice uh, uh, to, to run uh, three times uh, a week. Uh, I, I have a, a very good... Uh, um, I'm very fit. Uh, I take much care of my, my uh, weight and uh, the food. Uh, the food I take. <clears throat> However, uh, six months ago, suddenly I had a myocardial infarction. I was immediately revascularized, but uh, my ejection fraction now is uh, uh, 35 percent and has been stable over the last two months. My doctor says there is nothing that we, I can do for that. Right, so can, you please, can I please come there and you inject your microRNA in my heart? This is a typical, because this is a typical situation. You have these uh, even young people uh, who have nothing to do, basically, except uh, trying to preserve the portion of the heart that uh, they, still, they still have. Now, even in this condition, I would be very scary of injecting an AV vector that expresses a proliferative microRNA, because first I'm not sure of what could happen after eight months, after one year, after five years. And second, uh, I don't know if this vector has spread in, uh, in uh, uh, certainly some, some spreads, and uh, I don't know if uh, after one year there could be a tumor that has uh, kept growing and so on. So there are safety concerns on this. Uh, and so the bet best idea would be to have find a way of injecting these microRNAs as a simple, uh, uh, um, with carriers that allow them to remain there for a very short time. So basically, what we started doing in the laboratory, for, by now at the mouse level, was to see if we can find some lipid formulation that permits us to do a single injection in the heart at the moment of myocardial infarction. And we found one which is based on lipofectamine, by which uh, these are the levels, uh, normal levels of uh, microRNA 199 in the heart. And they don't change with myocardial infarction, first or later. They, they remain very, very low. If you inject uh, a naked microRNA with these lipids, then uh, this concentration increases uh, more than 200 times at uh, day two. But what is nice is that it, it remains there uh, sufficiently high for uh, at least 12 days. And not only it is there for 12 days, it's higher than endogenous, but it's also there in an active form because we know the direct target, so these microRNAs, like these proteins here, Homer, Click 5, and we see that they are down-regulated 
some of these uh, up to 12 days. So it means that uh, a single bolus injection would be sufficient uh, to have this microRNA remaining there. The question is, is it sufficient also for function? And the, in, in the mouse, it seems so. These are uh, mice hearts, uh, left ventricle, right ventricle, big scars in the controls. If you inject uh, this uh, uh, naked RNA uh, molecule or these naked RNA molecules, you see that these big scars are much, much smaller. So they are re very significantly smaller. If you look at uh, functional parameter, ejection fraction, fractional shortening, they are all uh, preserved. So it seems that a single injection of this microRNA is able to boost sufficient proliferation at the beginning that keeps the heart functioning even if you look after eight weeks from the uh, injection. Uh, the picture that you see are these. these are, this is a, a, the, the needle track so we have where we have injected the needle. And uh, you can see these are probably inflammatory cells that pile up. And these are small cardiomyocytes uh, that are formed after proliferation. So these cardiomyocytes with uh, the BRDU positive, uh, positive nucleus. This is another picture, which is very nice. You see they are smaller than, than the other because they have a newly formed. But they are there, and there are many of these. Uh, 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 around. So we believe that uh, it is a, a, a clinical scenario in which we have a patient and this patient has a myocardial infarction. It is resuscitated, it survives, there is no arrhythmia, it's brought to the hospital. It is revascularized. After three, four days from revascularization, then uh, scarring, uh, deposition of collagen, fibrous proliferation starts to occur. And just before that, uh, the uh, cardiologist goes back uh, to the heart, uh, to the coronary artery of this patient, inject a bolus of this microRNA. The microRNA goes into the survived cardiomyocytes, push them to proliferate and regenerate uh, a portion of the myocardium. Uh, this uh, has uh, the advantage also that in clinical terms, uh, you don't have to have 100% regeneration, but even if you have a 10%, 20% regenerated tissue in clinical terms for the outcome of this patient after 10 years from the infarction, this makes a dramatic difference. So we are convinced that this should be a path that we can follow to go to the clinics. Whether we will be able to have these as drugs. Oh, obviously, in terms of applicability, this is much better than, appears at least much better than stem cells, because for stem cells, you have to have the cells expand in the laboratory to be injected. And here, instead, you can put these microRNAs as sort of drugs in vials, and any interventional cardiology can inject them. So these are just drugs to be injected. Apart from that, I mean, I think that uh, there is a sort of <clears throat> paradigm shift from this kind of uh, of uh, uh, evidence that is not necessarily you have to rely on stem cells to uh, regenerate the heart or exogenous cells, but probably heart regeneration can be achieved by stimulation of endogenous cardiomyocyte proliferation. Obviously, microRNAs uh, are a proof of principle that this uh, can happen, can become drugs, but there are equally interesting possibilities in trying to find growth factors that uh, do this autonomously or in conjunction with the microRNA, and this is also, also what, uh, what uh, we have been doing. That's basically all what I wanted to tell you, and thank you for your attention. If you have questions, I'm uh, very pleased to, to try to answer.